Hello, my name is Mary MacLeod. I'm the Solicitor of the Church of Scotland and I'm going to say a few things on the topic of the Church and civil law. I'm going to do two things. I'm going to give you a breakdown of uh, two areas where you're most likely to bump into the civil law as you go about your business. And I'm secondly going to tell you a little bit about the Church's Law Department and how we can help you with that encounter. I should perhaps just say for clarification um, what th I mean by the civil law. Um, I mean basically anything that's not church law. Uh, church law is found in the acts and regulations of the General Assembly. It's found in its deliverances, in its common law, in practice and procedure of the church. Um, and all of that is the domain of the principal clerk. Um, anything that's outside the doors of the church is the civil law, and that's the domain of the law department. As far as you're concerned, I think the two areas where you're most likely to encounter civil law are charity law and employment law. Um, so I'm going to just touch very briefly on each of these. Charity law has, of course, been around for a very long time. The first mention of the idea that there should be certain purposes which the law should prefer um, dates back to the time of the first Queen Elizabeth and an Act of Parliament which uh, set out a list of good causes to be supported, uh, including the repair of church buildings. So remarkably in 400 years, not much has changed, at least in that respect. As ministers, you will in the usual case be a charity trustee for your congregation. What does that mean in practice? Well, it means that you have an overriding duty to act in the best interests of your congregation and in a way which is consistent with its charitable purpose, which in the case of the Church of Scotland is the advancement of religion. You've got to exercise proper stewardship of the assets of the congregation. You've got to act in a way which ensures the effective and accountable management of the congregation. And how that is usually expressed in practice is that you should act with the care and diligence that it is reasonable to expect of someone who is managing the affairs of another person. You should read your constitution, know what it says. You should know where to find it. You should ensure effective recruitment, induction and training for members of the Kirk Session and board. You should conduct meetings properly make sure that you have a standing item on the agenda for declarations of interest. You should have a format of uh, minutes and supporting papers. You should have a clear understanding and ideally a written statement of any delegated powers. And you should make sure that you give proper scrutiny to all financial affairs. You may find that you're um, a charity trustee not only for the congregation, but also for another body which may or may not be a charity. For example, a restricted fund within the congregational accounts or a third party where you may be a trustee as uh, an ex officio trustee by virtue of your office as parish minister. In both of these cases, you should be aware that you're not wearing your usual hat, you're not serving on that trust, or charity as uh, a trustee of the congregation, um, you have an, an duty in that case of undivided loyalty to that particular trust and uh, you must be particularly alive to the possibility of a conflict of interest arising. Um, it can be uh, difficult to deal with that and the law department is here to provide advice and help if you do find that you're in that situation. You'll all, I'm sure, be aware of the existence of Oscar the Office of the Scottish Charity Regulator, um, which has been in existence since 2006 and, as it says on the tin, is the statutory regulator for the charity sector in Scotland. It has powers of supervision, investigation and, in the worst case scenario, intervention. Um, it monitors all charities via their returns and their accounts. It investigates complaints of apparent misconduct and it can take remedial action up to and including removing the charity from the register. 
It's worth highlighting in passing that the Church of Scotland, along with the other main denominations in Scotland, has the status of a designated religious charity, which means that it is exempted from some of the regulatory controls of OSCAR. Um, this is a special status which recognises the legitimate authority of the churches in matters spiritual, um, but it's restricted to those charities which are able to evidence to OSCAR that their own internal structures are sufficiently robust to provide an acceptable degree of self-regulation. Having this status means, for example, that OSCAR can't interfere with the uh, appointment of a trustee, they can't suspend trustees and they can't uh, bar someone from being a charity trustee in a designated religious charity. But having said that, although there are advantages, obviously if Oscar finds misconduct um, or poor management in uh, a DRC, uh, then it could remove that status and therefore open up the church to the full range of regulatory controls which affect secular charities. So quite apart from the ethical compulsion to be a good trustee, there are obviously uh, sound reasons to show that um, we can regulate ourselves. Leaving charity law to one side, I'm going to say a few things about employment law. You'll all encounter employment law in the context of your congregations because you will all at some point or another employ people like church officers, cleaners, organists, youth workers, church secretaries. There are three things that you need to be aware of when you are looking at the employment relationship. Um, the first thing is that underpinning it all is a large body of black letter law, if you like. Um, there's a large amount of statute and also a significant body of case law which governs the rights and duties of the employment relationship. The second thing is the contract which you've signed with the employee. And it's remarkable how often people forget that the employment relationship is, at heart, fundamentally a contractual relationship. So that contract is important. And again, I'll point you towards the Law Circulars page of the church website, where we have um, a number of templates for employment contracts for different types of uh, job. The third thing that you need to be aware of is that there will be a body of policies uh, which will apply to that employment relationship, which may not be set out in the four corners of the contract. Um, you will have things like maybe family-friendly policies, um, absence management, performance management, that sort of thing. Um, and you need to be aware that they are also relevant to that relationship. The first step to forming the relationship, obviously, is the recruitment process. We're often asked if it is possible to specify in a job advertisement that you're looking for a Christian to do the job. In certain limited circumstances, the answer is yes. Churches can require job applicants to have a particular faith if having regard to the nature and the context of the work, um, it is an occupational requirement and that it can be shown that that requirement is uh, a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. This is only possible for a fairly narrow range of posts, usually those posts which exist to promote and represent the religion. So the more senior the post, the more likely it is that this requirement can be met. It's unlikely, for example, that you can meet it in the case of a church officer or a cleaner, um, but it is very likely that you would be able to meet it in the case of a youth worker. You'd also have to get over the hurdle of proportionality, which is just a legal way of saying that you mustn't take a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Uh, you've got to approach this in the least restrictive way possible um, in order to achieve your, your aim. If you do believe that an occupational requirement to be a Christian applies to the post, then you have to make that clear in the advertising. Um, and the reasoning should be explained in any application pack and made clear also during the selection process. If you decide that a post you want to advertise doesn't require to be filled by somebody with a Christian commitment, then you need to think about how you advertise. It could be deemed to be discriminatory not to advertise that post widely, but you should approach that, and again, in a, in a proportionate way. 
You should also be aware when recruiting of the limitations imposed by the Equality Act. I don't have time to go into all the various categories of discrimination which the Act covers, but just to mention briefly, one which does recur uh, from time to time is disability discrimination. And you should be aware that you can only ask a job applicant about their health in very limited circumstances uh, before they've been offered the job. You can ask questions about any reasonable adjustments that somebody might need in order to attend an interview or to go through the uh, application process. And at the interview, you can ask if they have any health issues which might affect their ability to do something which is an intrinsic part of the job itself. But you can't ask somebody to complete a health questionnaire before offering them the job. You can make a job conditional on um, a satisfactory pre-employment health check being carried out. But having done that, you cannot then withdraw an offer of employment because you find out that somebody has a disability. You need to consider what impact that might have on the job you want to appoint them to and whether it's possible to make any reasonable, reasonable adjustments to allow them to do that job. It's also important that you know who in the congregation is responsible for managing an employee. This may seem a blindingly obvious point, but it is actually a black hole into which people can fall into um, quite regularly. Um, I've had one employment tribunal case where neither the congregation nor the employee um, was able to say who the line manager was concerned. The management arrangements were entirely chaotic and it's fair to say that the um, employment judge took a fairly dim view of that. If you do employ a number of staff, then it's a good idea, I think, to have a small staffing committee um, set up by the Kirk session with one person uh, possibly delegated as, mine man as line manager and with powers from the Kirk session to carry out all the functions of a manager. If you have only one employee, then that might be overkill. A committee may not be necessary, but it would certainly be a good idea to have one person um, designated as the line manager of that employee. Because you do not want to get into a situation where an employee doesn't know what they're supposed to be doing or is put into a difficult position because they're getting competing instructions from different people. And in a congregational context, it's not difficult to see how that can arise. Another area which creates difficulties is performance management. I can't emphasise strongly enough that if you do have an employee who is not performing um, as you expect, then you really shouldn't let things drift. I appreciate that grasping that nettle isn't easy, particularly where somebody who is an employee is also a member of the congregation, as can often be the case. Um, but in the long run, it's in everyone's best interests to begin a performance management process as soon as a problem emerges. And you're then in a much better position to resolve these problems before you reach the critical point when you really just want to be rid of that employee and you can't face the idea of going through um, any sort of process before moving to dismiss them. And that, I'm sure I don't need to say, is a recipe for disaster. Employees need to know what's expected of them. They can't be criticised if they're not doing what they didn't know they were supposed to do. You would normally have an informal part to any capability process where you would have a quiet word with somebody um, to let them know that their performance maybe isn't up to scratch. Um, and that if they don't improve, you will be starting a capability procedure. You don't need to have a written procedure, although it's a good idea to have that. All that you need to do, to be fair, is to let somebody know there's a problem give them a reasonable time frame within which to improve and if they require any support and additional training then make that available to them. So that's just scratching the surface obviously of uh, what's involved in the employment relationship. Um, that's all I've got time to say today. I'm conscious of the fact that um, there might be a feeling that you know you as ministers didn't get into ministry in order to become charity administrators or um, employers. Um, so I now want to point you towards the resources which are available to help you to carry out those roles. I think that the church is actually uniquely well placed amongst not only other denominations in Scotland, but also amongst other charities in that we've got an in-house legal team who are here to help you and are either free at the point of need or 
um, if not free, then certainly significantly cheaper uh, than any alternative. And we're not only cheap, we are relatively cheerful. Um, I read an article recently about why lawyers are, for the most part, so miserable. And it concluded that this was because of the vortex of hatred in which lawyers live. Um, they tend to despise themselves because they develop character traits which aren't terribly likable. They become aggressive, adversarial, um, judgmental, um, pessimistic. They hate other lawyers because of these very character traits and also because they expect treachery. They are hated by their clients because they charge too much and they don't always get the outcome that the clients want and they despise their clients right back. But in contrast, in the law department, we're not like that. We're on the side of the angels. We're embedded in the church. We understand it. We know its constraints, its peculiarities, its internal rules and procedures. And we have wide experience through a team of 10 lawyers um, across uh, a huge range of areas. We have, as I've mentioned a couple of times, uh, circulars on a lot of things, including the things I've mentioned today. We also have circulars on property law, various aspects of property law. We can help you if you have difficulties with, say, a problem tenant and a manse, if you are buying or selling property, if you're letting property. Uh, we deal with church constitutions, um, health and safety, um, copyright, rates, water charges. Um, inevitably, data protection raises its ugly head. And I realise that, that that is a biggie. Uh, we're currently working on uh, ensuring that the church is in a position to be compliant with the new data protection laws which come into force across the EU in May of next year. We'll be issuing updated guidance in due course, but for the moment I would recommend that you look at the law pages on the website which contain a lot of detailed guidance and best practice advice. I just want to finish by saying that the Law Society of Scotland ran an advertising campaign a few years ago and the tagline was, it's never too early to call your solicitor. And if you take nothing else away from this talk, that's the message I'd like to leave with you. Thank you.